How's everyone this morning? Yes. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful teaching we had from Jacob yesterday. I was so excited. I feel like listening to him for the first time. I remember the first time I listened to Jacob and I said, who is this guy? Who is this Jewish guy? Where's he been all my life? And, uh, but nonetheless, um, it's wonderful to be with God's people here on the other side of the Atlantic. First time in the UK. Although uh, I do have to say my wife's family is from the UK. Uh, second generation, she's from north of England. And uh, hey. <laughs> so via Canada to Southern California. I don't know how that girl got there, but eventually I married her. So I wasn't born in the UK and I wasn't born in America either. I was born in a little country in Central America called Nicaragua. Has anyone heard of it? Yeah. Well, most people have not. <laughs> they asked me, what part of Mexico is it? And I said, well, <laughs> not quite south. <laughs> a little bit about myself before we get started. Many of you guys may not know. Uh, this is our church, uh, Devore Truth, Community Church of Devore. That's our ministry. We're affiliated with Morial Ministry. And uh, praise God for this church. It's a wonderful church full of wonderful believers just like you. They're hungry for Jesus and they live in a tough place because uh, California might as well say, um, I don't know, uh, what's a place like that? I might as well say communist Russia, communist China. Um, it might as well be that. I, we don't have Stalin and things like that, but we have uh, other politicians like Pelosi and Gavin Newsom that are just as bad. Pelosi. Yeah. <laughs> But nonetheless, that's where we live. We live in Babylon. Then again, all believers in some way or some form are like the Jewish people in exile. We haven't been home yet. We're not home yet, but we are on the way home, on the way home. I was born in Nicaragua, a communist country, civil war, unbelievable, death, famines. You can, uh, you can read about it more if you, if, you, if you care to, but it was unbelievable to see. By God's grace and mercy, uh, our family escaped from there. We came to the States, and um, even though it was brought a Catholic home and um, baptized as a Catholic and things like that and uh, grew up in that culture never a Catholic uh, per faith um, as, as, a, as a willing choice just by nature by culture by just being born in a Catholic country however when I came to the States uh, I abandoned all kinds of religion I didn't I didn't want religion I thought religion was a con game and things like that it, it was just un, not, not a good thing but I became like an agnostic. I could not accept anything that the Bible said. And I rejected it completely. When I became, uh, when I got into university, I wanted to uh, be a doctor. I wanted to study science. I wanted to uh, prove that through scientific methods you could become a better person. And I strived to be a good person, even though I was a hypocrite. And I'd, uh, everything that I did was hypocritically, uh, was hypocritically done. My sister became a Christian just before I was 20, 21 years old, and uh, she witnessed to me. And through her testimony and the conviction of the Holy Spirit in university, I became a Christian, surrendered my life to the Lord. And I abandoned all kinds of Gnostic ideas and Gnosticism and agnosticism and all the isms. And uh, I only ended up liking two isms, evangelism and baptism. Those are the only two <laughs> isms that I ended up liking ended up leaving communism and anything you could imagine. God had to do a tremendous brainwashing to my life and to my mind. And um, I realized socialism and communism doesn't work. And I like what Margaret Thatcher said and from this country, right? Socialism, is, it's good, it's great. But the problem with it is when you run out of other people's money. That's the problem with socialism. You run out of other people's money. Absolutely true, no doubt about it. But nonetheless, that, that was me. That was early university. So instead of uh, arguing against Christians and arguing for things like evolution that I used to believe in, I became for Christians and I became uh, a preacher of the gospel and evangelist and the joke's on me. I went from an agnostic arguing against Christians to a pastor and a teacher and uh, arguing for the validity of scripture and the authenticity of God's word. Uh, that's how much God can change a person, but that's not we're not here to talk about myself, but my family I have five children five children and um, That sounds like a lot in California, but I went to the Midwest and some people had 12 13 children So I look like a small family um, But my wife's at home my children are at home. They're praying even though it's really late at night right now It's almost uh, well, it's almost morning and um, after I became a Christian, I started serving in children's ministry, serving with the youth and uh, helping evangelism. 
back in 2004, 2005, after being saved for some time, I, the Lord called me out from a church that I was at. I, I went to a Calvary Chapel, and uh, the Lord began to do a work in my life and began to pro uh, uh, prompt me to start a Bible study at home. And I didn't know why. I didn't know exactly what the reason was at that time. God knew later that um, the great apostasy had set in. I had no idea what had happened. I was in a bubble. I was completely unaware of things like the emerging church, things like the signs and wonders movement. I knew there were some things wrong with, uh, with uh, Christian expressions and things like that, but I didn't know why. Became a, uh, I become a Christian, things were rather good. But once I realized what has happened to the church, I realized what God had called me to do and had called me to be a pastor and a teacher. And out of desperation, out of a reaction to what was going on in America with the signs and wonders movements that was pre it's prevalent in California. We'll talk more about that. Um, we're not too far from uh, Redding, California, which is Bethel Church. And uh, we're not too far from other places like Rick Warren's uh, ministry there. Uh, so-called ministry it is it is a it is unbelievable to see what happens in California I think everybody who is an apostate everybody who wants to have false teachings comes to California for some reason or another but that's where we live God began to show me that we needed to stand up for the truth and that's what we call our ministry divorce truth we needed to be about the truth we needed to be about God's uh, truth and his word 2004-2005, um, somebody handed me a, an article on persecution, and it was written by a guy named J.J. Prash, which I'd <laughs> never heard of before. <laughs> but I tell you what, that article really began to change me. And, and I said, I never heard of this guy. Who writes like this? I never heard anybody speak like this. Well, after, uh, I, put, I put the article away, put it in my back pocket, Lo and behold, a guy in our Bible study shows up one day and I said, I went to a conference. You've got to hear this guy. I said, who is it? It's some guy named Jake, uh, James Jacob Prash. And I said, is that the guy from the article? And it was about Israel and who supports Israel and who doesn't. And I said, I, I got to know who this guy is. This, this is. this is truth. This is reality. I got a hold of David Lister, Memorial Ministry, and the rest is history. We've been uh, together with Jacob since about 2004, 2005. And in 2006, our, our little Bible study ended up in a building, in a church building that God provided for us even to this day. It's in Devore, Southern California, near the San Bernardino Mountains. August 2006, uh, Jacob showed up and he taught our, our, one of the first Bible studies there. And we're so thankful for that. He spent a whole weekend with me. We spent a lot of time together. And since then, we've been, uh, we've been good brothers. We've been good friends. And now I get to serve with him, alongside with him in uh, Moriel, not only helping with the, with the board and missions and things like that, but nonetheless, that is my story, very briefly. There's more to it than that, uh, but God has a lot of grace toward us. And uh, we're so committed. Uh, I, I know Jacob has a laser focus on commitment on evangelism, teaching and preaching and getting uh, the church ready for the Lord's return. And uh, we're even working on the Spanish ministry. So I get to help out on the Spanish ministry side too. And we have a website in Spanish, uh, Morial Español. So si alguien aquí habla español, podemos ir a la a la internet y pueden encontrar una página de internet con todos los mensajes de Jacobo traducidos a español. Um, so if anybody was interested, you can go to the website, Memorial Español, and we have uh, Jacob's Bible Studies, and there's some of mine there too, uh, translated into Spanish. So um, we have a, a great deal of passion for his, uh, Spanish people, English people, Jewish people, all tribes, tongues, and nations. Today, strengthen the things that remain. This is an important message, I believe, for the church today, the church in America. The English-speaking world needs to strengthen the things that remain because there's not a whole lot remaining. Let's pray and ask the Lord what he's going to show us. Father, in Jesus' name and for his sake, we ask that you open our minds and our hearts to what your word says. Please, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, show us, Lord, not only what it means, Lord God, but how to apply it in our lives. Lord, we're so desperate for the things of you. We're so desperate that it will rain again in our lives and in our churches and in our ministry. Father, please help us to become more active in serving you, serving others. Lord, show us what we need to do in these days. It is so heartbreaking to see so many gone different ways and away from you. But Lord, as we're here before you and together with our believers, we pray that we'll be able to be effective in a ministry. 
Please, Lord, help us and teach us how to do this. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Turn to Revelation chapter 3, please. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. By the way, if uh, anybody's interested, we have a YouTube channel for our fellowship, and you can find uh, Jacob's stuff there too, ourselves, and other wonderful teachers that are part of our ministry. And we have a YouTube channel with lots of messages there. And if you, um, they're all free. You can, you can download them. There's no copyright in it, like Beryl said. There's no copyright. Use them, spread them out. Revelation chapter 3, to the church of Sardis, and to the angel of the church of Sardis, write, he who has the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed or fulfilled in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. But I have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Seven churches of Revelation. Seven churches of Revelation, seven letters, seven churches. It follows this pattern of seven. It's all sevens in the book of Revelation. Seven spirits, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven churches, seven seals, seven vials of wrath, etc., etc. The Antichrist is always with the six, and he's got the culmination 666. God's had the sevens, and he's got the sevens all the way through. Seven churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Every one of the churches ends with that kind of message. If you are listening, you have to do something about it, is what Jesus is saying. If you're listening, you have to do something with it. It is not meant to be kept in your back pocket or in a nice message that you take home with you. You have to do something with it. And Jesus was very good at this. Every time he told a story or he explained something, he would say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And he would leave it at that because then we would have to deal with it with the Lord ourselves. And so these seven churches, obviously it is for the first century. There were real churches at the real time, and Jesus has spoke to them. But the application and principles are for all churches throughout all times. There's different ages that are described in this, and if you have the book, Dilemma Laodicea, do we have the book back there, Dilemma Laodicea? Find it, all the information that I could have shared with you, it's in that book right there. Jacob does a great job of the ages and periods of church history. But nonetheless, the application and principles are for all churches, for all believers, for all time. And there's reasons why Jesus specifically deals with all these things to those churches. There are things in there that those individual churches would know, and you'll see that in a moment. But the churches were living in an environment where they were looking from the inside out and they didn't quite understand what it looked like from the outside in. They needed Jesus to tell them what it was. You know, you get so used to something, you become so used to it, you never notice. It's like your house, right? You think, it's, well, it's been my house. It's been like that all along. And somebody comes along and says, well, you need to paint your house or you need to fix this or you need to, well, I, did, I didn't see that. I didn't know that. Many times that's what happens to churches. They become so self introspect it, that they don't really see how the outside looks into that church and the outsider comes in and looks at it and says what are you guys doing and Jesus is an outsider looking in and saying there's something wrong there's something that's going on here not all the time there's two churches that he actually compliments has nothing bad to say he walks in the midst of the lampstands the Bible says he walks in the midst of the churches but there's encouragement and this is what I want to leave you with today encouragement to those who overcome but correction and chastening to those who are not. That's the message of Jesus. It's encouragement to those who are overcoming and those who overcome. And there's great promises and great rewards, but chastening and correction to those who are not. And of course, the Lord does it because he loves us. It says in the scriptures in Hebrews, he chastens those he loves. He corrects those are his own. The reason why he does it is because he wants us to be holy. He wants us to share in his holiness, it says in the book of Hebrews. But these seven letters, when you look at them synoptically, meaning you looked at them side by side, sin, side, optic, view, side by side, we notice some interesting things. There are churches that Jesus approves of. He approves of them. 
And two of them, he has nothing bad to say about them, but he encourages them to keep doing what they're doing and to continue on in the faith, especially Smyrna, that was being persecuted. Jesus gives approval. Uh, he describes himself to every one of the churches in a unique way. All come from the Old Testament and the New Testament, but there's a description of Jesus in every one of those churches, and they're different descriptions. And it's something that the church needed for that particular time. Either they forgot who Jesus was, or they needed to be reminded of his nature and his character, and therefore Jesus gives those beautiful descriptions of Jesus, and we have one here in verse 1, the seven spirits of God. But he gives approval, he gives criticism, he gives his counsel, do this, straighten this out, remember, repent, do the things that you knew what to do. There's his counsel, but there's his assurance as well. If you overcome, the overcomer has assurance and encouragement, by the way. And he has an appeal at the end. He who has an ear, let him hear. And notice the things that Jesus approves us and approves of, and notice the things that he doesn't like. Those are things that are important. This is for the, all the seven churches, but we're going to look at Sardis in a moment. There are two churches that he says nothing bad about. There are two churches that he says nothing good about. We're going to look at one today, and you remember the other one, Laodicea, which is the lemma Laodicea has the book there, Jacob in the back. But he talks about the devil, doesn't he? He talks about the enemy in these seven letters more than any other letters. I think more than Paul, more than Peter, Jesus speaks about the enemy and what he is about. The enemy is roaring like a, uh, he's, he's roaming like a roaring lion. Paul talks about this, but Jesus, remember, he encourages the church. Don't forget this. Don't forget this. Satan comes and he tries to destroy the church from within and he's very good about planting tares. And so these letters are like a thermometer. These letters are like a thermometer to your church, to my church, to you individually, to me individually. What do we look like? What does Jesus say about our church? What would he say about us? And what do we need to do to correct some of the things that Jesus says? And uh, by the way, one of the churches was all about tolerance. Isn't that a wonderful thing, tolerance today? That one, California might as well be the tolerant state. We allow anything, everything and anything for the sake of tolerance. And one of the churches, Thyatara, was all about tolerance and appeasement. Tolerance and appeasement. You tolerate this woman Jezebel, it says. I'm not going to get into it. I'm so tempted to go into this because of all the stuff going on in the churches today. But I will leave it up to the Lord and uh, for his wrath for a different time. But the churches tolerate and appease every form of sin and every form of false doctrine today. I'm saying as a church as a whole, I'm not saying you, I'm not saying our church, I'm not saying you particularly, but as a whole, appeasement. And like Western Churchill said, is like the appeaser, is like the man who feeds the crocodile and hopes that he eats them last. Eventually, all these churches are going to face several consequences, and it's not going to be necessarily from the world, but it will be from the Lord as well. He will come, and he'll chasten the church, and you'll see that in a moment, how he warns this church, strengthen the things that remain. How about you go to a church that everybody approves of? Everybody loves it. Everybody thinks it's great. You go to this church, and the world thinks it's awesome, but Jesus doesn't think it's awesome. How about that? It's a great church, Church of Sardis, right? It's a dead church. It's a dying church. Everything else after that is wonderful. It's a dying church. It's a dead church. After that, it's a wonderful church. And people loved it. People love to come to this church. By the way, just some background in history. Um, by the way, mind the gap. We, I was all over uh, all the railways uh, of London this past couple of days, and I kept seeing this. Well, Mind the Gap has to do also with history. We don't understand too much of what Jesus was talking about because we need to remember history. We need to remember what they were dealing with. And the Church of Sardis has an interesting thing. They had it, uh, it was built like uh, on a cliff. And these are just some of the ruins that are there. This is just from history and background, so you mind the gap. The gap between them and us, so we can shorten the gap and we can understand what Jesus said and why he said those things. Sardis was built on a cliff originally, and they had this Acropolis, and it's a wonderful area, and this, they had this summit city, and it was called the Unpregnable City. Uh, they, they had this uh, uh, cliff, and you couldn't get there unless uh, you knew the road. And every time there would be the enemies outside, the, the city would run up to this cliff, and they would maintain safety there until the enemies left. Similar to Masada, it's a very, very similar story. And so they felt so safe and so secure 
because it was built on this vertical cliffs, incredible height, and uh, we have some of the ruins here. And it's amazing that even though it was built like this twice, it was overtaken. Twice it was overtaken because of their own faulty, because of their own faulty reasoning, because of their own presumption and their own ideas about what safety was. But it was built at the necropolis, and you got these 30 miles, 30 miles from Thyatara. It's the end of the Royal Road. At the time this was written, it was built on the Royal Road. It was built by, these roads were built by the kings of Persia. And on the ends of these roads were these tray routes, and it was sitting on one of the tray routes. Sardis was incredibly influential because it was incredibly wealthy, incredibly wealthy. And uh, it was the capital of King Croesus. Capital of King Croesus at one point. They minted gold coins, gold coins, silver coins. It was nonetheless a very wealthy and very rich city. They had need for nothing, just like Laodicea. And it's quite fascinating that even to this day, there's, there's, there's people that still pan for gold in that area, looking for gold through the rivers, because they say that you can still find some of the residue, some of the residue from this gold. But one of the things that happened to Sardis, by the way, they had the temple to Artemis or Diana, similar to Ephesus. And by the way, uh, one of the attributes of Diana or Artemis is that she can bring life from the dead. She can bring life from death. So you could see some of the things Jesus said, some of the things that they would know, some of the things that they understood, and some of the things that could apply to their lives. So what, what's one of those things? Well, as you highlight your Bible, and by the way, these are some of the highlights, and uh, by the way, you could do those things to your Bible. It's okay. You could do it on your neighbor's Bible, too. If he doesn't want to highlight it, you can highlight it for, highlight it for them. Wealth makes you self-sufficient. Wealth makes you self-sufficient. In fact, one of the things that happened to Sardis was the Roman emperor gave them tax breaks because of the earthquakes that they had in that area, gave them tax breaks. You know what they did with those tax breaks? It says, no thanks, keep them. We'll build the city ourselves. No thanks. We can do it ourselves. Self-sufficiency. Number two, self-confidence. Self-confident. Uh, this Acropolis in which they lived in had these cliffs and these passages all the way up to the cliff. But like I told you earlier, twice it was conquered. 549 and 218 BC by the Persians and the Greeks it was conquered. How were they conquered? It's an interesting question. Twice it happened the same way. Twice it happened the same way. As the Persians and the Greeks approached, they all went up to this cliff, they all maintained safety, they looked down, they, they, they make fun of their enemies. And as they're looking down at the enemies, the enemies were figuring out, how do we get up there? There's no way to do it. However, one of the soldiers dropped an armor, a piece of armor, a helmet, and it went all the way down to the cliff, and he went down, and he picked it up, and he went back up to the cliff, and the enemies noticed where he came from, and they traced his steps back, and on the way up, the soldiers were sleeping. The soldiers were sleeping, and another time, the soldiers had abandoned posts because they were safe. Who's going to get up there and conquer us? Nobody. However, twice it happened to them. They knew the story. Twice it happened. The soldiers were asleep. The soldiers were asleep, and the soldiers abandoned their post. Therefore, the enemy came in and conquered them. Jesus says twice in this letter, wake up. They would have known what that meant. Remember, he's talking to them in the context of their History, their sits and live, as we call it. They knew about this. And Jesus says, wake up, but he applies them in a spiritual sense, in a more, a bigger predicament, a bigger issue. Nonetheless, number three, they were self-indulgent. Self-indulgent. This is something that has happened to the church today. Self-indulgency. I live in California, fifth largest economy in the world. Fifth largest economy in the world. world largest and larger economies in most countries. It's unbelievable. And these things happen to the church. The churches, they look like the fifth largest economy in the world. The churches begin to look like society. You have a high society, you have a, well, a good economy, wealth, and things like that. The church begins to adopt those very things, and they become like the world. They become like the churches. They become like the world. And in those days in Sardis, they had luxury living. They had bathhouses. They had stadiums, gymnasiums, entertainment centers, 
And lo and behold, the church just became like that. By the way, they have on earth a synagogue in that area, and those synagogues are fantastic. It's a fantastic synagogue. And my goodness, I said, they had state-of-the-art stuff. They had unbelievable stuff. And yet, not one thing is mentioned uh, about the church in that area as being persecuted or being attacked or being any of influence to the world, meaning that they were not against the grain. Mm -hmm. And if the synagogue looked like that, you, my, my friend, you better believe the church just looked exactly like that. Luxury living, entertainment. Herodotus said being in Sardis was a byword for standard of moral, lack of moral standards and licentiousness. This was the city of Sardis adopted into the church. They live like that. And the real danger, the real danger for any society, it's not the enemies outside. It's corruption within. It's corruption within. Absolutely. Read Gibbon's decline, of the, uh, the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Most societies, he describes there, the fall of the Roman society, but he describes that societies don't fall from enemies coming in. Societies fall from within. I'm from Latin America, my family's from Latin America. You go to the ruins today of the Incas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and you'll find incredible monuments, incredible pyramids, incredible things. You go, who conquered them? Nobody. What happened to them? Why they don't exist? Moral corruption and licentiousness from within. That's what happens to every society, and it's happening to our own society. I live in America, civilization, I live in California. We actually are contemplating the idea whether pedophilia should be something of a protective class. Can you believe that? I could not even imagine explaining this to my grandmother or my grandfather that at one point in America there'll be pedophilia being talked about as a protective class. Because, you know, they need to love too, is what they say. They need to love too. They need to have a love relationship with someone. And yet, this is society. By the way, in California and many places, and other places like. Uh, Austin, Texas, uh, believe it or not, they're implementing a school curriculum that involves all kinds of yeah. immorality and LGBT and things that you would be embarrassed to even look at yourself as adults, let alone teach that to your kids, yeah. and yet that is being passed as education. Yeah. It's not arithmetic anymore, it's not reading, it's not writing, it's not history, it is sexuality. And you could be anything you want. You could be a boy, you could be a girl, you can be, a, uh, you could be fluid, you could be binary, non-binary, all kinds of things, 37 different uh, genders in New York City. You can apply to those things. So, um, and it's going to get worse, and it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Society, it's becoming like that. But what about the church? What about when these things become so confusing that the church has no answer for them? The church has no answer, and we feel safe because we're in this cliff, and we feel fine because, hey, who's going to come up here and take us? And yet the very thing that Sardis was looking at, it's the very thing we're looking at today in the 21st century, strengthen the things that remain. Look at verse 1. To the angel of the church of Sardis, he who has the seven spirits of God, seven stars, says, as I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. They thought they were alive. Jesus says, no, you're dead. It's one thing if um, everybody else agrees on one thing. It's one, another thing if Jesus says, no, it's not that. It's this. And it's a thermometer to show, it, to show them exactly where they were. It's unbelievable to think. The seven spirits of God, is, of course, speaks of the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially in the life of Jesus. It is the manifestation of the Spirit in the life of Jesus, prophesied in Isaiah chapter 11. Won't go into that. It's a whole uh, other subject, but it has to do with the rainbow. I think Jacob has a study on that, uh, the rainbow and the seven spirits of God. But it has to do with the prophecy from Isaiah about the manifestation of the Spirit of God, the energy, the working of the Spirit in the life of Jesus. Not the fruit of the Spirit, not the gift of the Spirit, but it's the ministry of the Spirit in the life of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I have the Spirit, I give the Spirit. He's the one, he's the fountain of the living water. The living water is the Holy Spirit. He's gonna pour it out. Anything that has to do in the church has to be done through the Holy Spirit. Anything that has to do in the church has to do with the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of grace. He's the Spirit in our lives. He's the Spirit of power in the church. Jesus has the Spirit. He's reminding the uh, people of Sardis, the church of Sardis, you need the Spirit. You've forgotten the Spirit. You've left the Spirit. There's something that is wrong in the church, and it's dead. 
A, spirit, a body without a spirit is dead. A body without a spirit is dead. It would seem, in this case, indicate that Sardis looked like a great corpse. A great corpse. And it was just unbelievable how well it looked. It had makeup on. It had all the wonderful lotions, but it was dead. And Jesus said, I have the spirit. I have the spirit to whoever wants it. And Jesus said in the great day of the feast, the last great day of the feast, whoever is thirsty, whoever thirsts, come to me and I will give them of living water. Jesus is willing to give Sardis the living water. Back to the church. Back to what it used to be. And the Spirit of God is what we need in our lives today. And the church to strengthen the things that remain. No wonder he speaks of this first because they had done something. They forgot something. They ignored it. And now they were dead. They had great programs. You know a church can function. A church can function without the Holy Spirit. It's unbelievable. It's the weirdest thing to me. That a church can function without the Holy Spirit. You can have programs. You can have pastors. You can have teachers. You can have a radio show, a radio ministry, TV ministry. You can have books. You can have sales. You can have CDs and MP3s and all kinds of things. And you can have wonderful programs and wonderful things to show the world that you're great and invite everyone. And you could be lacking the Spirit. And you can function that way. Simply on inertia. Simply on just moving forward what you used to be and say, we're a church. Look, we have a building and a steeple and a cross. We gotta be alive. And Jesus says, no, you are dead. And it's quite a slap in the face to these people that thought they were alive. But the approval of the church is not mentioned at all in this letter. The approval of Sardis, not mentioned at all. Meaning Jesus had nothing good to say about this church. But it is a church and Jesus cares for it. And he wants the people there to repent. Let's look at verse 2. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. You're dead and you're asleep. You're dead and you're asleep. You need to wake up. There is some type of com uh, a coma that the church was in. It was a coma. It, it, was, it was functioning as a church, but with no life. It was, th there might have been some form of life in terms of what it looked like, but it was really dead. And it was, a coma, it was a coma. It was just a, a, a God, a, an ungodliness, meaning that there was no God involved in that relationship in the church. But it still functioned as a church, which is the scariest thing. I think Jacob mentioned about the Laodicea, the biggest problem with Laodicea. It wasn't all the things that is described in that letter uh, necessarily. There were all some summations of that, but the biggest problem is they did not know that they were Laodicea. They, they did not know that they were poor, wretched, blind, naked. They had no idea. And Jesus accuses them, you are dead. You have a form of godliness, but deny the power, the way Paul would have put it. It was a plastic church. It was a plastic church because it looked like a church, but it was hollow. And if you ever had a, a, a plastic fruit or something like that, you can go to someone's house and look at, the, look at the setting on this table. It looks fantastic. Look at the fruit. And you go up there and try to eat it and it's a big dud. It is a big zero. It's plastic. Jesus walked up to the tree. He was hungry, looking for food. He walked up to the fig tree, and what did he find? Nothing but leaves. Nothing but leaves. No fruit of the Spirit. What did Jesus say? Well, just go to another tree. Is that what he did? No. He cursed it. The next day, they looked at it and said, it's dead. It's a dead tree. Yes, if you had faith like this, you can move a mountain into the ocean. That's what Jesus said. If you had faith, this is about faith. This is about trusting God. But this is the correction of God to a dead church. It says here, I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. You start something. You, you, you start, you want to do something, and you never finish it. You never complete it. You're lacking. You're lacking. It's never fulfilled. It comes to nothing. You promise great things. You promise wonderful things. You promise this is going to change. The church is going to change you. It's going to change your lives. I read a, uh, I didn't read it because I didn't want to read it after to read the first page of The Purpose Driven Life, but this is a long time ago. And I said, this book will change your life. And I said, oh man, I already found the book that changed my life. What do I need another book for? <laughs> Hallelujah. But in that book, it promises, if you read this for 40 days and you highlight it and you do all that, you promise to God, take an oath, whatever it does, then you're going to be a different person. Well, it's been, what, uh, maybe 20 years since that book came out, maybe a little bit less. Has it changed anything? No. It made uh, Rick Warren's account change really quick. You know, it made, a, it made his account really well, made his church really a lot of money. But nothing changed. 
they promise all kinds of things. And I could tell you, go and lit me of things, of churches and ministries and books and, and revivals. They promise, promise after promise, it's going to change, it's going to change, it's going to change. And I've lived through some of them. I was a young Christian when all the Pensacola stuff and all the Toronto stuff started coming along. I wasn't a Christian when Brownsville was around, but I heard about it. I was a Christian when Lakeland, Lakeland Florida came along and all these revivals that were promised. And by the way, I live in California, Reading, Bethel. It's not too far from where I live, just up the coast. Every week they promise something. Every week they promise a revival is coming. California is going to change. We're going to take the cities for God and all kinds of things. You know, California is one of the largest amount of churches per capita in the world. You can go down California, up and down the coast, you find thousands of churches, thousands of churches. But California is one of the most godless states in the country. Now that doesn't make sense. You take a survey, most Californians would say they're Christians, most. It's changing, but most would say that they're Christians, they go to church in some kind of form. But this, is the state any more godly? Is the state any more closer to God? Is the state more reasonably at least moral no it's actually worse it's actually a joke you're from california oh boy we need to pray for you <laughs> yes it's true i go to other parts of the country a little more conservative oh you're from california oh boy keep an eye on this guy <laughs> just because it it carries a certain kind of credence it, it it's you know you're sort of this liberal thing this this you know all goes and nothing happens right all moral all moral restraints go out the window how does this happen? How can we have so many churches, and even by, let's say, just moral standards, we still vote for homosexuality, homosexual marriage, abortion? How can this be? How can there be so many Christians, quote unquote, so many churches, quote unquote, and yet could be a completely godless state? You tell me. It's because the church is hollow. It's a plastic church with a plastic Bible and a plastic faith. It's not real. And Jesus says, there's still hope, though. Because he's writing to them. If Jesus had cast them off, it wouldn't be a letter to Sardis, and there wouldn't be a letter to churches like this. It's because Jesus cares, and he still has a plan for those who will hear. And you'll see that in a moment. By the way, all these advertisements, all these advertisements about revivals that come, you know, they promise all the, nothing. Nothing ever comes, because only God can bring the revival. Only people's faith and repentance and tears will ever bring about with God's sovereignty a revival that's going to be of, 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 of necessary means, especially we need it now. Now, I don't think it's going to happen worldwide. Personally, I read the book of Revelation. I read what Paul said. I think it could happen individually. I think it could happen to churches and small groups and pockets of groups, but I don't expect anything worldwide. I do expect the Jews to have a revival. I do expect the Jews to come back to faith. The natural branches will come back. That's what Paul said in uh, the book of Romans. But with all these things, they had a passivity, by the way. They were passive about it. Now, if you, somebody told you, hey, you're dead. I think if you listen to that message and somebody told you you're dead, you either don't believe it, or if you do believe it, you would do something about it. But they had a passivity. They were listening to the world, and they say, wait a minute. All the world things were great. Society things were awesome. They come to our Christmas programs. They come to our Easter programs. They come to our uh, whatever other programs we have. We are very well entrenched in society. But what do they say? That you're great, that you have prosperity, that you have blessings from God. By the way, this idea of the material possessions means a blessing from God. It's one of the largest deceptions in the church today. I know of great, wonderful churches that have zero, zero money in their budget for the next year. Wonderful churches in the third world, zero dollars to their budget. But they're a wonderful church. Are you telling me they're not blessed? You telling me God doesn't care about them? It simply means that whatever they need, God's going to provide. Even if it's zero, God has a different economy. Prosperity and blessing, it's no means to me, no barometer to mean that that's a church from God. But that's the way we think, especially in our society, especially in a Western affluent society. We think that church has got this uh, million dollar you know, budget and that's going to be great. That's, uh, that's God's blessing. And not necessarily it's not, doesn't mean that it isn't. It's just not the standard that which we must we go by. Because there's many wonderful churches that don't have a penny to their name, and yet they have the approval of Jesus. Was there any hope? Let's read what Jesus said. Uh, verse 3. Remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. 
If therefore you don't, you will not wake up. Here's the second time. Wake up, wake up. Wake up, church. Wake up. Understand what's happening. I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come. But you have a few people. See, there's hope. There are always a few. There are always a remnant according to grace, as Paul says. Jesus is giving the people in Sardis an example of what they need to be like. There are a few names. Even in difficult circumstances, there's always Christians who are faithful. Even in difficult circumstances, society falling apart, there are Christians who remain faithful. And this is what Jesus is saying. They meet together. They keep on with Jesus. And there's a book of life, by the way, and Jesus knows the name. He explains it here. They have not sold their garments. They will walk with me in white. They're worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. I've got a few names. They're not soiled, and they're in the book. That's the key. That's the key to it all. By the way, in Sardis, they had gymnasiums and entertainment, and they loved sports. I'm not sure if uh, the UK loves sports, but uh, in, in America, it is a god. It is a religion. It is all kinds of sports, from hockey to baseball to football to basketball, you name it, entertainment. Sardis was no different. And when they were finished their gymnasium or they finished their workouts, they would go and take a bath and they would wear white garments all along the road. This was something that they knew from society, that they, would, they, would, they were people who, after putting off the grungy and the dirty things, they would put on white garments and walk through the town after their workout. Jesus is pointing this out to them. You see those that walk in white garments? I have my own. I have people like that. And of course, they're not soiled. They're ready. They're white. And, and by the way, white is the most impressive color in the book of Revelation. White garments, white stone, white throne of judgment, all these white stuff. And of course, white uh, reflects all the colors of the rainbow. Of course, it's something pure. It's th speaking of something pure, something holy, something of God. And Sardis, wake up. Look at the past, Jesus says. Remember what you have received and heard. At one time, they believed it. At one time they believed it, at one time they had it, at one time they received it. What did they receive? Well, they received the gospel and they received the spirit. They received the gospel and they received the spirit. That's the gift of God, by the way. That's a wonderful, you know, wonderful when you become a Christian, God gives you gifts. He gives you gifts. It's a wonderful, I love to tell that to young believers. You know, God's going to do something for you. He died on the cross, rose from the dead for you, and he has a gift for you. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And there's other gifts that come along with that. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? The gifts of the Spirit. He himself is the gift. Paul said to the Galatians, those foolish Galatians, he says, you begun in the Spirit. Are you going to be made right with God in the flesh? Having begun in the Spirit, are you going to be made right in the flesh? Remember how you received it. Remember how you received it. The Holy Spirit needs to be poured out in the church daily, on our lives, daily. John Wesley says, don't rely on your past faith. It's not safe. Don't rely on your past faith. It is not safe. Many people today rely on their past. Oh, 20 years ago, the Lord was doing this. 30 years ago, the Lord was doing that. And I meet believers like that. I meet believers all the time. Oh, 30 years ago, I was baptized. Well, where are you today? Well, I've been to church in 20 years, live with my girlfriend and smoke pot all day. <laughs> Happens in California all the time. Well, but, but I received something that day. You might have, but where are you at now? Don't rely on your past faith. Jesus, uh, Paul talked about the faith that I have today, the life that I live today, the faith that I have today. I live by faith in Jesus Christ and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That what I have today. Don't rely on your past faith. Jesus says, remember that. The remember what you heard. Remember the teaching of the apostles. Remember what they taught you. Let's look at the present. Let's look at the present. Verse 2. Strengthen the things that remain. So you've got to remember the past, what you heard and where you came from. But now you've got to do something. And you've got to strengthen the things that remain because they're dying. Because they're dying. We need to put focus and attention to what God is telling us to do as a church. Church in England, church in the UK, church in America. We need to focus on what God has told us to do 
and strengthen those things before they die, before they die. I don't know how much uh, it is here in the UK, but in America we have a large population of older believers, older believers, that unless the Lord comes in the next 15, 20 years, they're going to be with Him. And we have a gap. We have a gap between children and the older believers. Strengthen the things that remain. We need to strengthen that which we have today. What's the focus of the church today? This is what we're going to be talking about this weekend. And I hope in the second message and maybe the last message uh, on Sunday, we'll be able to address these things in practical ways because I believe the Lord wants us to do, do things practically, not just theory, not just theology. By the way, the Holy Spirit is not just theology. Most people say, I'm just content with having the Holy Spirit as a theology. They put it in the back pocket. They know the doctrine, but they don't know him personally. They don't understand the working of the Spirit in their lives. They don't understand that Jesus wants to give it every day and pour it out. Paul says, go on being filled with the Spirit. Go on. Go on being with Him. What things are about to die? What things are about to die? Is Bible teaching dying in our, in our country? Is evangelism dying in our country? Is fasting and prayer? Do we get together for fasting and praying anymore? No. That sounds like a, a forgotten virtue anymore, right? It's more about, well, you know, we just got to go to lunch after service. We just have to, you know, meet me for lunch, meet me for this. And I'm speaking of our own country. We forget the very things that God says. Strengthen those things that remain. How about taking care of each other? How about visiting one another? How about taking care of the weak, taking care of the sick, taking care of the widows, taking care of those that God has put in our lives and says, you know what? I need to strengthen that. I need to strengthen that relationship. You have a broken relationship with the brother. You have a strained relationship with the sister. Strengthen the things that remain. Watch and pray. These things are coming. Be watchful, Jesus says. Be watchful of what? Be watchful of what is coming. What is God doing to you? As a side note, turn to Psalm chapter 84, please. Psalm 84. It's a wonderful psalm. Where are you going with God? That's the question for the church today. Where are we going with God? Are we content with sitting in a room, in a pew, in a service, and saying, well, this is all there is, and this is all there needs to be? Oh, my friend, there's more. So much more. Psalm 84, please. Psalm 84. A wonderful psalm of pilgrimage. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul long and even yearns for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. And the birds also uh, in the house. Did I get the wrong one? Psalm 84. Oh. Psalm 83. Oh, I got, must have got the wrong one. I think it's the right one. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Is that some? Verse 4. Oh, I need better glasses. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you. Verse 5. Whose heart are on the highways to Zion. Another translation says, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now, what was that about? The Jewish people, every time they would go, they would go from different places of Israel, the north, the south, the east, the west, and they would go toward pilgrimage. They would go to Zion. They would go to Jerusalem. How difficult was it to get to Jerusalem? Sometimes very difficult. Sometimes you had to go through creeks and rivers and jungles and, plant and mountains and deserts. But no car. That's right. They didn't have Teslas back there. They didn't have any cars like that. But you know what they did? They set their heart on pilgrimage. What was pilgrimage about? What, what were they going for? To meet with God. To meet with God. To meet with God's people. Their heart was set on pilgrimage. Where are we moving with God? No matter what difficulties you face, no matter how hardships you face, set your heart on pilgrimage. Set your heart to meet with the Lord. Set your heart to meet with others. No matter the difficulties in the landscape that you face and circumstances that you have, God is going to meet you there. Despite the battles, move on. Move on with the Lord because you want to be in that city. You want to be in that city with God. And we're going somewhere, by the way. We're going to the heavenly Jerusalem. We're going to Zion. Is there something that's going to stop you? Is there any wilderness, any deserts, any hardships, any things that will stop you if your heart is set on a journey of truth, if your heart is set for Zion? That's where you're going, my friend. Don't stop. Keep going. And that's the encouragement of Jesus. Set your heart on pilgrimage.
keep walking with them. Don't let anything stop you. Watch, wake up, and be ready. Now, go back to Revelation because Jesus has an encouragement here. He has more encouragement because of those who are watching. By the way, God speaks to us about this stuff. I met believers, never met them before, never talked to them before, got to meet them, maybe on mission trips, and God is showing them the very same things they showed me. Unbelievable. And it's sometimes even more, because they would be more faithful than me. And I just take encouragement from them because there's people all over the world that God's speaking to them and God's showing them things that you won't get from a theological book. <laughs> you won't get from a theological school. There are things in the scripture and by the spirit that God is revealing to Christians to be ready and to get ready. I love the book, A.W. Tozer. You guys know A.W. Tozer? Oh, yeah. God Speaks to the Man Who Cares. A wonderful book. God Speaks to the Man Who Cares. You know who God speaks to? The people that care. You know who doesn't speak to? The lazy ones. The ones that are dead. The ones that don't, don't care. God doesn't, want to, God doesn't deal with that. God speaks to the man who cares. Do we care enough? Do we want to know? And see, that's what Jesus is talking about here. A few people were watching, and here's the key. Out of this great church, out of this magnificent, opulent church, just a few cared. Just a few cared. And Jesus said, you see them? I want you to be just like them. A few people were watching. And so the Bible, by the way, the Bible never encourages part-time Christianity, by the way. Did you realize that? The Bible never encourages part-time Christianity actually tells you not to be a part-time Christian. But the Bible encourages full-time, full commitment, full engagement. And my friend, it's the Spirit of God telling you you're not fully engaged, you're not fully committed, you're not fully uh, involved in the things of me. Are you strengthening the things that remain? God will speak to the man who cares, by the way. He'll tell you if you care. <laughs> what do we do in England? What do we do in America? God will tell us if you really care. If you really care for what's happening to the church here, if you really want to know what Jesus wants to do in this church, and, and I consider this a church, an assembly, God cares, God will speak to the man who cares. If you really want to change America, Bulgaria, Mexico, the UK, if you really want to be involved, God will speak to you, He'll give you the strength to do it. Might not give you the numbers, because there are only a few, but don't care about the numbers. Don't worry about the numbers. God always saves by few, not by many. Let's keep going, because Jesus is going to give a great encouragement. The Lord knows those who are his, by the way. And whoever names the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Paul told, to, told that to Timothy, right? Paul told that to Timothy. The Lord knows those who are his, and let those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You want to know if you're his? Depart from iniquity. It's the greatest measurement that you can have. Depart from iniquity. Today, depart from it. That which God is showing you, depart from it, leave, and draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. He promised that. But let's look at the future. If you, therefore, verse 3, if you, therefore, will not wake up, if you refuse to wake up, if you don't want to do anything about it, you don't care, God speaks to the man who cares, but if you don't care, I will come like a thief. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. This is written to a church. Isn't the coming of Jesus like a thief in the night for the world and the unbelievers? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it is. But it's also for sleepy Christians. Mm -hmm. It is also for sleepy Christians. Jesus is saying here, if you don't, I will come like a thief. It is absolutely true. He will come like a thief in the night if you're not watching. And Paul makes it very clear. Those who are of the night, those who are in the day, he, he juxtaposes the two. He said, we're children of the light. We're supposed to be children of the light. That day will not, caught you, will not catch you unaware. Mm -hmm. But if you're not watching, and this is all about wake up and watch and be careful, mm -hmm. then he will come like a thief. Every time the thief in the night has to do with judgment, he will come in judgment. He will come for those who are not alert. He will come, and there are many signs, my friend, today. I don't know if we're going to have time to do that. Jacob talked about many signs yesterday. I don't know if Jacob's going to go on today, later on, explaining those signs, many signs from 66 AD. But there are many signs today, my friend, that it tells us it is the last hour. Yeah. It is getting close. And I don't, I don't date set. I'm not Jonathan Kahn. I don't date set or anything like that. <laughs> but at the same time, this is the last hour. 
we're living in a very precarious time. Unlike anything we've ever seen before. I don't think there's any Christian alive today that, uh, that could say, if they're watching, this is unique. We've never seen anything like this. We could say 1948, Israel came a nation, 67, the, the, the Jerusalem, all these things came about in the last century, um, in the last 100 years, but nothing like today. The rampant immoral behavior of the world, the antagonism toward Christ and the yes. faith, the persecution of believers, the apostasy of the church, yet on and on and on, and it's not like it's happening one here and one there, all happening together at the same time. What are we to conclude? He's coming like a thief in the night to those who are watching. If you're of the day, he will come for us, for rescue, for saving. Jesus, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus will appear again a second time, bringing salvation to those who are looking, to those who are eagerly await. Hallelujah. That's what he's, that's what he's, he's bringing salvation. We'll talk about that at the end. If we have it, how come he's bringing it? It's a good question. Don't, don't hold on to that. Hold on to that. The promise. Here's the promise. You have a few people. And if you, uh, if, if those who have not sold their garments, they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. By the way, the idea of worthiness here, it's the same idea of Revelation 5. Jesus opens the seals because he's worthy, because he was slain. He was faithful unto death. These men, these men and women of Sardis were worthy, are worthy, because Jesus has made them worthy. They were faithful. See, worthiness has nothing to do with our own merit and what we've done. It has to do with faithfulness. See, so many people today, they look at the world and they go, Pastor, persecution, I don't want to die. I say, I don't want to die either. But it's not about death. It's, it's, forget that idea. It's not about death. It's about faithfulness. It's about, the last days are about faithfulness. It has nothing to do with, you know, I lose my life and this and that. And it, you know what? Maybe that may come, but I know this. In a hundred years, we'll all be dead. <laughs> we'll all be with the Lord. I know that for sure. For not a doubt, a hundred years from now, every one of us, unless there's a baby around here somewhere, uh, will be with the Lord if you're a believer, if you're a Christian. It's not going to be a matter of death. We're all going to experience that. And by the way, I'm dying already because uh, my outward man is perishing. And by, after 30 years, uh, after, after I was 30, I had less cells replicating than they're actually uh, dying. There are more cells dying than replicating. So I'm already in that process. Not to encourage you or anything like that, but you're already in that process. Yeah. And we know what it's like because we die to self daily and live according to the Spirit. We already understand what that is like, to leave and lay aside every weight and every sin that hinders us. That's what's going to happen at death. We've got to leave everything aside and we'll be with the Lord, and we'll be one with Jesus at that moment in time. We'll be there with him face to face. That's what we're looking forward to. But the promise is, he who endures to the end shall be saved, Jesus said. He who endures to the end. They have white garments. They have not soiled them. They're worthy. They have no corruption because they repent, and they believe, and they're holding on to, even though there's only a few of them. Jesus is telling the church of Sardis, join them. Join these people. Join these men. And God is telling us today, join them. Yes. See the example? This was not written in a vacuum. This happened at a, to a real church, to real people. And it was put in the word of God for all eternity so we would be encouraged by them. It was written for us. Mm -hmm. It was written that we will have the same encouragement, oh, the right. same desire, the same passion, the same love, the same promise to those who walk with Jesus. But let's keep reading. He's got more promises. He who endures till the end shall be saved. Absolutely. He who overcomes. Verse 5. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garment, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. This is an interesting thing here. Jesus is getting more deep. We're talking about deep things now. We're talking about things that the church as a whole runs away from this. You're talking about that I'm not, that, that, that I could be erased. Well, that's what Jesus says. I'm not putting words in his mouth. That's what he said. He who overcomes. Let's talk about that. Those who imitate those who were in Sardis. They were not polluting themselves with the things of the world and the things of the church. They were alive. They were imitating. Uh, they're, they're encouraged. The people of Sardis were encouraged to imitate those who were overcoming. By the way, we're going to talk about overcomers this afternoon. What is an overcomer? What does that mean? And the promises from the churches. And by the way, all in the New Testament... He who overcomes. There's a great promise in the book of Revelation to those who overcome. Recognize, those who recognize the deadness 
in their lives and they do something about it. You know that's an overcomer? They recognize something that's dead in their lives and they do something about it. I guess the question is, do we want to know? Do we want to recognize? I don't have any deadness in me, do I? Ask the Lord. Is there things that are dying? Is your evangelism dying off? Is your prayer life dying off? Is your Bible reading dying off? Is your encouragement dying off? Strengthen those things that remain, Jesus says. Overcome those things. Those who are white garments are fit to be in his presence, and they'll go before the Lord. They will walk in white. This is a great promise. Jesus encourages us to walk with him. This is why the Christian faith is a walk, my friend. It's not a static faith. It's a walk. Jesus walked everywhere, and he encouraged us to follow him. We walked with God. He walked with Enoch. He walked in the garden. He walked with his disciples. He walked in Emmaus. He walked in the midst of the church. And it says, when you get to heaven, I'm going to put on my shoes. It's the old Negro spiritual, right? I'm going to put on my shoes. I'm going to walk with Jesus. Amen. And those were written by, was sang by people who had no shoes. <laughs> They're going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to put on my shoes and walk with the Lord. If we don't walk with God now, we won't walk with them later. That's the reality. The book of Isaiah says that idols have eyes and they have ears and they have feet and they have hands, but they cannot walk here or touch or do anything. But our God can. Our God can for sure. Secondly, controversial, permanent record. The promise is I will leave a permanent record. Your name will be confessed before my father and before the angels. There's a book of life, by the way, here. We know that. We're told that in Malachi. We're told that in Psalms twice. We're told that in Exodus. We're told that in Philippians. This is not an isolated event. No one should be here and go, what is the book of life? It's in the Bible. Many times, Old Testament, New Testament. What is the book of life? It is the record of all the believers that are truly his, truly his, are recorded in heaven. Jesus knows. That's the reference. Philippians, Malachi, Psalms, Exodus, right? Revelation here. Literally in the Greek, to be scraped off. Because in those days, they didn't have Sharpies or markers or Jacob was using that. There's no way to remove those in those days unless you've got a knife and you scraped it off. You scraped off the name. That's interesting. Jesus says, I won't scrape it off from the ink parchment. I won't scrape it off to those who overcome. To those who overcome, you guarantee from Jesus, you won't be scraped off. Isn't that wonderful? But your name will be confessed. Your name will be publicly displayed in all of heaven, for all of heaven to know, the Father and the angels, that, I don't know, your name, Beryl is mine, right? Davy is mine. Jacob, can you imagine Jesus confessing your name in all of heaven, echoing all across eternity? You're mine, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. Overcomers, Jesus says, if you overcome. What if you don't overcome, Pastor? Great question. I'm glad you asked. What if you don't overcome? He's talking to Sardis. He's talking to Christians. He's not talking to Satanists or atheists or agnostics. I was an agnostic at one time. He's not talking to them. He's talking to the church of Jesus. Christians who are not right. Christians that won't get it right. Christians that don't care. And Christians that don't overcome. We'll talk about overcoming. He says... This is going to happen to you. It's a stern warning, isn't it? And I could hear a hush in our spirit sometimes where you go, Lord, is it I? But you know, if you care, it's a good sign it's not you. <laughs> if you care, it's a good sign it's not you. But make sure it's not you. It says it will happen. Just make sure it's not you. Do you know the great apostasy is happening? And it will happen. It will continue to happen, the Bible says. But it doesn't have to happen to you. That's a great thing. I mean, it's awful to think about it, but it doesn't have to happen to you. If you overcome, if you're faithful, it doesn't have to happen to your church. It doesn't have to happen to your pastor. Pray for him. Pray for them. It doesn't have to happen. That, but Jesus makes the warning. If you don't overcome, this is the opposite, right? He who overcomes, but if you don't, what will happen? If you overcome, I won't take the name off the book. But there'll be a recognition. You, heard, you talked about it earlier. There'll be a public recognition. And those Christians who did not overcome, those Christians who did not overcome will not walk with Jesus. Will not walk with Jesus in white garments. They'll have their names scraped off their book of life. And they'll be denied before the angels and the Father, it says. Jesus says, if you confess me, I'll confess you. If you deny me, I'll deny you. And denial has to do with faith. Denial has to do with 
Are you walking with Jesus today? I mean, think about it. If you don't want to be with Jesus today, why would you want to be with Jesus in eternity? If you don't meet with them today, why, why would you want to spend all of eternity with them? Those who long for him, right? Whose heart is set on a journey of truth, whose heart is says, I want to go to Mount Zion. I want to go to the heavenly Jerusalem. I can't wait to get there. And every day I meet with Jesus. It's like Mount Zion, but I'm not there yet because the resurrection of the body has not happened yet. And that's the appeal to the church. Look what it says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. One more verse, if you don't mind. I know we got to end. Philippians chapter 3. Just want to leave you with this. Keep moving on with Jesus, by the way. Keep moving on with Christ. Philippians chapter 3, Paul tells us this. Just to encourage you. Because we want to encourage and strengthen the things that remain. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Famous chapter, famous verse. Paul talks about his pedigree. Talks about his pedigree. Talks about what he's overcome. Despite who he was as a Pharisee. This is who he is as a, as a Christian. More than that, I count all things to be lost. Philippians 3, 8. In the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord. The greatest thing you'll know, my friend, is Jesus. The greatest one you'll know is Jesus. Yeah. Knowing him is everything. No matter what you've become and achieved in this world, the greatest thing you'll be in this life is a follower of Jesus. The greatest thing is to know Christ. By far, exceeds anything. And I hope you value that. I hope that weighs heavy in your heart. I said, you might, be, you might be a doctor, you might be a, 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 a vice president of a company, you might be whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you can say, you know what, more than that, those things are lost to me. Yeah. For the surpassing knowledge of Jesus is the greatest thing. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and come to be rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him. Rubbish, nice English word, it's a crude, it's a crude Greek word, scubula. Won't tell you what it means, tell you what for another time. Crude word. People would have been shocked in nice churches like this one. Scubula. He said scubula. Rubbish. Nice way of saying dung. Nice way of saying what you put in the potty. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. Those things are lost to me. They're rubbish. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being conformed to his death. Now notice this in verse 11. In order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He wasn't resurrected yet. He didn't have the full, all the, all the things that God wanted for Paul wasn't there yet because he hadn't had the resurrection yet. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that which I also uh, that for which I also was laid a hold of by Christ Jesus. The word is apprehended. Paul was apprehended by Christ. Remember, he was apprehending Christians. In the book of Acts, he was apprehended by Christ. And it says, there's a reason Christ apprehended me. There's a reason. The reason Christ arrested you. Remember the day he arrested you? Did you ever feel like you were arrested? He's so kind. He's so precious. He didn't feel like an arrest, but he was really arresting us. He says, you belong to me now. I'm apprehending you. For a great purpose, a great reason I apprehended you. And that is to be my witnesses. Oh, I was apprehended. That means I'm done. No, Paul says, no, I have to lay a hold of that very reason why he apprehended me. I'm not perfect yet. What Paul is saying here, I am saved, but I'm not totally saved yet. That's another way of Paul saying it. I am pressing on to salvation. I'm looking forward to salvation. Aren't you looking forward to salvation? I am looking forward to being totally saved. I know that grabs people sometimes by the ears and go, what? Yeah. I am looking forward to being totally saved. Am I saved now? Yes, I'm justified. Yeah. But I press on Amen. in that process in which Jesus has for me. And there's more ahead for me. And there's a crown of righteousness that the Lord himself will give. And there's crowns, there's rewards, there's ministry, there's opportunities. There's all these things that God has for me because I will be totally saved at the resurrection. And when that happens, I will be I will be once saved, always saved at that point. And I will shout it. I will be completely saved. And I'll be totally saved because this body will put on an immortal body. This corruptible person will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. And then we can shout hallelujah. And we can say to death, oh, you can't take me now. 
We can say to death, we can't take me now. The grave, you can't take me now because death is swallowed up in victory. Thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are justified, but we're not done yet, my friend. This is why the book of Revelations encourages the overcomer. Keep going. Do not stop. And you need to be strengthened because along the way, our hands get feeble, our feet get weak, and we need one another to strengthen the things that remain. My friend, I want to pray, but I want to leave you with this. He who hears the words of Jesus, take heed what he's communicating. Take heed what he's communicating. Forget about me, and I don't count. It doesn't matter what I have said, but it matters what Jesus said. If it's rung in your ears and the spirit of truth is bearing witness that that is true, then we must do something about it. We can't go home this weekend and say, well, all bygones be bygones and go back to normal. It has to be changed. There's a behavior that needs to be altered and the spirit of God needs to be poured out in our lives. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh Lord, we are so in need of a message from you like this. There's no doubt that we are in need of your power and strength. Strengthen the things that remain, oh Lord. I look at the church and I think, Lord, who's left? Who's left? And yet I look at my brothers and sisters here, and I look at my brothers and sisters in our church and other churches, and I say, oh Lord, yes, there are those who have not soiled their garments. Please keep them, Lord. Please empower them by your glorious spirit to, be walk, to walk with you, Lord, that they will walk with white garments one day, Lord God. There will be this joy, unspeakable joy, Peter says. But Lord, I praise you that you warned the church. I thank you that you have not given up on your church, that there's still hope if we strengthen the things that remain. If we remember where we came from, if we repent, and if we look forward to walking with white garments. Lord, yes, you speak to the man who cares. Absolutely. Lord, I pray we care. I pray you give us a heart that cares for our brothers and sisters on my left, on my right, behind me, in front of me. And help me, Lord God, to be the one who strengthens that which remains. Please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for letting me share. God bless you guys.